welcome to our worship service at Historic Fort Street United Methodist Church in downtown Lynchburg, Virginia. It's so good to have you with us. We broadcast on Facebook on Sundays and on YouTube on Monday morning. If you'd like to contact us, you can contact us on our Facebook page or at courtstreetmethodist.com. We would love to hear from you. We need to pray for all of those who are sick and suffering, all of those who have gone on to be with the Lord. We need to pray for their families this week also. We also need to pray for our country and for the whole and the he, for the healing that's needed to bring us all together in unity. Let us pray. Oh Father, we have gathered here again in your presence. You are the God of heaven. You made everything on earth by the command of your word. We appreciate and exalt you for your faithfulness in our lives. We come to you and cast all our cares on you because you care for us. You have created us in abundance. Remove every lack from our lives. Let us be renewed. Give us the strength face our weakness. Let everything we do in this service glorify your name. We worship you because you are our God. Thank you. 
pray a prayer of illumination. God, our source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be open. Amen. The gospel reading for today comes from the gospel according to St. John. I'll be reading from chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what signs have you to show for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. The Jews then said, If it has taken 46 years to build the temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The question I want to propose for today is, what does it mean to be the church of Jesus? I recently read an article entitled, Boring Church Service That Changed My Life. And the author writes that there was never a day in his life when he wasn't going to church. His parents were both heavily involved in the church. And he writes that he believes more than ever that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is what saves you. But he adds this, I also believe that in some way church does or did save me. It didn't save me in the way you might expect. It wasn't a spectacular Sunday service or home run sermon or a gripping worship set. God's primary tool to transform my heart was not a conference speaker or a traveling evangelist or a worship concert. Those events were important. But now I realize that more often God changed my life using routine worship services in which I sang hymns that I didn't quite understand, heard messages that I didn't quite grasp, and now in dark and stormy seasons, what comes into my head first? The lines from the hymns I learned as a child in church. The verses I memorized on Wednesday night the passages of scriptures we stood and read aloud. During times of fear and anxiety, I drift back to those words of hope. And now the author of the article is a pastor himself, and he finishes the article by, by saying this. 
When I think back on the simple routine, the liturgy that changed my life, I'm encouraged in my own pastoral work. I'm reminded afresh that the work of ministry is not so much about finding new and analyzing ways to make people excited about Jesus, but about the timeless rituals that shape people's hearts. Because somewhere in your congregation are children that are singing words that they don't know, listening to scriptures that they don't understand, fighting sleep during a sermon that doesn't hold their interest, and they don't realize it yet, but the Spirit of God is pressing the gospel message through yet another boring church service and pressing it deep within their hearts. And I love those words. And I hope those words convict each one of your hearts. Convict you to get out there and try to get as many troubled kids in church as possible. How many children live in homes surrounding this church and surrounding your home that are in bed watching television or looking at their phones? How many of them are not even aware of what goes on in the church? How many children don't know that Jesus loves them? They don't know that there is a God. How many don't know that they are of sacred birth? And there are people in the church and in this world they care about them. I'm afraid there are tons of kids around that don't know these things. And what can we do to bring them in? If we can't bring the parents in, at least maybe we can bring the kids in. I think that's our only hope. And I think that's their only hope as well. If Nicholas Cruz or Adam Lanzo or any number of the other kids who have shot up our schools over the past two decades had been brought into a loving church, think about how many children would be alive today. I'm not trying to say that churches are perfect. They're not. Many people get hurt in churches. Churches have problems. After all, churches are made up of people. That's why the church of Jesus Christ needs to be honest and sincere in its quest to find out what it means to truly be the church of Jesus. I love the church. And Jesus loved the temple. And he refused to allow the temple to be anything other than a place where people find God. When Jesus entered the temple in our gospel lesson for today, he found very little in the way of love for God and neighbor. Instead, it looked and sounded like an open air market. The cattle were moving. Sheep were bleeding, the turtle doves were cooing, people were yelling, coins were changing. And these things had to happen in order for the temple to function. It had, all, it had become almost entirely corrupt. The temple tax had to be paid in the temple coinage. So money changes were a necessary part of what was happening in there. The problem was they weren't giving people a fair exchange. They were ripping people off. 
Also the people coming into the temple either brought their own animals for the sacrifice or they could buy an animal from the temple. God had set this system up in order to aid those who traveled for the long distance. It wasn't supposed to be about making money. In any event, what had happened was that since sacrificial animals had to be without blemish, even if folks had brought animals of their own from outside of the temple and brought them in, the animals had to pass an inspection. And due to the corrupt system, there weren't hardly any animals that passed. So just about everyone had to buy an animal from the temple at an outrageous price. The temple had become corrupt. Greedy people were making money, hands over fist at the expense of God's agenda, which is helping the poor, reaching out to the least of these, practicing social and economic justice, and worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So Jesus drove all of this mess drove it all from the temple area and said, how dare you turn my father's house into a market? And because of this, the pilgrims who came couldn't celebrate Passover properly. And the temple lost a great deal of revenue for that. You know, we could easily point out at the churches that preach the prosperity gospel. It seems that many are only focused on money, thus making many of those pastors rich. It's a modern day analysis of what made Jesus so mad at the temple. But you know, we all get things wrong one way or another, don't we? There's not much point in bashing other churches. We need to focus on ourselves. And the question we need to ask is, what can we do better? Where do we fall short? It should come as no surprise that the religious leaders question Jesus about his brazen attack on they demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered, see this temple, destroy it, and I can rebuild it in three days. And they take Jesus literally, and it enrages them. In Matthew and Mark, it tells us that this is one of the specific charges they bring against Jesus at his trial. And of course, it's thrown back into the face of his tormentors as he dies on the cross. But Jesus isn't talking about the physical temple. He's talking about his body. And his enemies to destroy him. And they will think that the deed is done when he's on that cross. And for an instant, in the shadow of the cross, it seems they've won. But this will not be the end. For Jesus will rise from the dead. And this Jewish man crucified outside of Jerusalem will be raised to stand forever replacing the temple. People will try to destroy him again and again and they still do today but ultimately all those efforts are in vain. You know particular churches may come and go 
And at times it may seem like the church of Jesus Christ is soft. We have so many buildings, huge structures that were once filled, but now are nearly empty. Almost every church across every denomination is in rapid decline today. On any given Sunday, there are many, many more children out playing in front of yards or sitting in front of their computers rather than sitting in a church. There are many parents who are sleeping off hangovers or working or playing rather than bringing their children to worship to learn about God. We live in a culture that no longer puts great value in the church. We live in a very secular time. But this is not a reason to give up. This is a reason to get busy. For where will these people turn when the going gets rough and things get dark? grab a gun and kill somebody? Will they turn to alcohol or drugs? What other options will they have? This is a reason to learn what it means to be the church of Jesus and then to do it well and to do it with integrity. We need to live it. We need to be it. For the church of Jesus Christ is the only hope for this world. The late Fred Craddock tells a story about visiting his father who was dying of throat cancer in the hospital in Nashville. And when he got there, his dad was taking a nap. And so he started looking at the flowers and cards. There were cards from the Sunday school class, from church circles, from youth groups, from the choir, just about every group you could think of in a church had remembered his dad. And Fred said that the remarkable thing was that his dad didn't even go to church. His mom was active, but his dad never saw any need to go to church. And Fred said that when his dad woke up and smiled and reached out his hand because he couldn't speak. After a while, he took out a pencil and wrote down on the back of a Kleenex box. I was wrong to go to church. Jesus gave his life in order to save people. Through the church. Through the church. And this is a good church. It's a really good church. And as we close out this time of worship, I'd like to share a few more words from that article that I read at the beginning of the service today. The author says, Week after week, as a young child, enduring the routines of church, I didn't realize what was happening to me. This repetition built in my heart a deep reservoir of theology. And now as a husband and a father and a pastor, whenever I stand and sing the hymn, I can barely contain myself. Times I cannot even sing, I only weep. Some of the choruses in, invoke memories, like my father serving communion while playing Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross, was playing faintly in the background. And I remember Dad fighting back tears as we sang Jesus Paid It All. 
these rituals bring a heart. We sing to ourselves songs, hymns, spiritual songs. We hear the same gospel preached to us over and over again. We lift up the cup at communion to our lips, the bread to our tongue, remembering again and again our place at the king's table. Through these practices, God takes our heart and seals them to the court above. Who is missing from the church know how important it is that they be here. And I'll leave you with this question. What will we do? Let us pray. Father God, give us welcoming hearts and the courage to invite all of God's children to come into this church to hear those songs to hear those words that have inspired so many before us. Encourage us to never give up on inviting others to come and to have a deep and meaningful relationship with God. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray this prayer. Amen. <laughs> Majesty, dominion, and authority before all time.